we are. So first of all, welcome to the show officially. Um, let's start with the kind of the really obvious question. Where did, when did you find CrossFit? I found CrossFit in 2007. So it's That's been a while. OG. Yeah. Uh, it was, I was working at the time in Jacksonville, Florida. Or so for those of you who aren't really familiar with the United States geography, it's on the East Coast, Southeast, uh, where Florida is, obviously. And it's in the like the upper right hand corner of where Florida is. And I was at a local TV station there and I'd been working out pretty much my whole life, but just doing it the way that, you know, most people do it where you go in on a Monday and then you're going to do chest and then Tuesday is going to be, you know, back and buys and Wednesdays, uh, shoulders, stuff like that, you know, very typical kind of globo gym stuff. And I was getting, I got kind of tired of it. It's like, I just got to do something new. It just isn't getting me to where I want to get. And at the time I, I worked with a, a guy, still my friend, um, he was one of our producers, uh, videographers in our sports department. And his wife was a personal trainer, not CrossFit affiliated or anything, but was just working at like a, a regular kind of fitness studio where they had personal training clients. And, and she had started incorporating CrossFit into her uh, training regimen with her clients. And, and my friend told me about it. He goes, you need to check it out. You go on the website and they have like a workout of the day that you do. And it's all different stuff. And I said, oh, that sounds pretty cool. And I remember I looked it up and I think the first workout I saw was it was something like like five by five back squat or shoulder press or something like that. And I was like, well, that doesn't seem like much. Mm. So I kind of blew it off. And then I eventually said, okay, I'm going to go give this a try. And I signed up for some, some training sessions with her. And, and she taught me some basics. Uh, I think the first day I did, uh, you know, I learned how to kind of squat and sort of learn how to do a kipping pull up, just basic stuff. And we did some other things. And then we ended it with all she had me do is 10 rounds for time of Cindy. And it almost killed me. And I went, okay, this is the real deal. This is how I need to start working out. And I was immediately hooked and just head first, dived right into it and was trying to you know, find all the information I could on it. And, and I had this realization, I was 33 at the time, I had this realization that I have been doing this wrong my whole life. Um, yeah, and from there on, I've, just, I've been doing it ever since. Yeah, so some people at that point when they do 10 rounds of Cindy and it crushes them, they like avoid that experience yeah. ever again. What, <laughs> yep. what had happened until that point where you're like, oh, this is for me. I think I, cause I felt challenged. It was the first time that I walked out of the gym going, man, that was hard. Uh, most of the time I would go and work out on my dinner break when I was working at the TV station I would come back and I wasn't, you know, I, I felt like I pushed some weights around, but I wasn't tired. I didn't, I hadn't challenged and pushed myself to that limit in a long time. Usually when I was exerting myself like that, it was playing a sport. And I realized that dude, this is a whole new level that I, I can reach with my fitness. Uh, and then the, the, the nutrition followed after that and really just changed my life. But it was more of the, I always, I've always wanted to just be at my best regard, whether, regardless of where that is, I just wanted to be my best. Um, and I felt like doing that on a consistent basis would get me there. It would take, it would just take me to the next level. Yeah. It's an instant realization where it's like, oh, I see how much my best is. I see what my potential yeah. actually is as a, as a relative point to where I am now. It's mm -hmm. an interesting story. So what happened with, um, what happened with your journey from that point on and training and competing and all that kind of stuff? I just really, like I said, threw myself into it. I was in Jacksonville at the time there were no actual CrossFit gyms. When I first started, there was CrossFit East, which was an online affiliate, which I think was the second affiliate in the world, but it was just online. And it, uh, a lot of the uh, law enforcement officers in, in Northeast Florida used it. And I would go to their website, but they never had a location. So I couldn't go to that gym. So I, I was working out at just a global gym, um, doing CrossFit stuff, getting weird looks from people. There was a gym that finally opened up in Jacksonville beach that I believe is still there. Um, where I, I started going every now and then, and then they started springing up all over the place. And now they're, they're, you know, they're just everywhere. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, I just worked out in, in global gyms, did stuff on my own, um, you know, tried to figure stuff out by watching videos, didn't really have a, a lot of coaching. And then finally, that there was an affiliate that opened up almost across the street from where I worked. And I joined there and was able to, uh, you know, get a little more coaching, um, and, and still, it was really much in it. It's, it's, it was really in its infancy. So I didn't get, everyone was still just trying to figure things out. We were all sort of helping each other out. There weren't the subject matter experts like we have now uh, who are around. But yeah, then I, I, I worked out of that affiliate for a while and then ended up moving back to California. 
and join an affiliate there. And uh, then that's kind of how I fell into the whole media side of things. Yeah. So you were like, I'm going to get the terminology all kinds of wrong because we, we'd call you commentator over here. So the sports anchor, is that the kind of correct phrasing? So there's, a, there's a, yes, there's a, and there's a difference between you. So, so yeah. the way we would use sports anchor here is someone who you would turn on your newscast or a, and they, they're up there at the desk and they're doing highlights and they're, they're part of a larger newscast. So that was, a, that was my original job was a sports anchor in that setting. And I did that at three different stations around the United States. Yeah, how'd you get into that? That's a it's kind of I, I see it as a niche employment. Like how'd you how'd you yeah, find that? I well I always it's it's a weird story. I I always wanted to be involved in film. I was a big movie fan and still am. And I went to college originally at San Francisco State University as a film major. And then I got into the department and I looked around and I looked at some of the people. I said, I don't think I this is for me. This is not the crew I want to be around. And it was I, I just didn't have a good feeling about it. And I, I'd always loved sports. And they had a pretty good broadcasting class, their department there, I should say, at San Francisco State. And I looked into it, and they actually had a sports casting class. I said, well, this sounds great. And I was still in the mindset of I want to do something behind the camera, whether it's uh, shooting video for a, a sports league or you know, editing highlight video, something like that. And I enrolled in the, I changed my major, enrolled in the sports casting class. And the cool thing about that class at the time was this is pre-internet. Uh, so there was, you know, there's no streaming or anything like that, but we would, we would broadcast all of our sporting events on, well, I shouldn't say all, most of them on what was known here in the United States as public access television. Mm -hmm. um, so we did that and they let you basically do any job you wanted. You could direct, you could produce, you could run graphics, you could run camera, you could, you know, be a play-by-play -play person or a commentator. And my turn came up to be a commentator and I did some stuff on camera and the professor said, you know, you, you did really well at this. You should, you should do some more. And that's sort of how it started. And then I, out of college, I got my first job in, in Kalispell, Montana, which is Pacific Northwest, uh, where, you know, upper left-hand corner of the United States, sort of in a couple States. Um, and it was in like a small little market, I got my first job there. And I worked there for a year and a half. And then I moved to Florida, which is, you know, complete other opposite end of the country and, and worked in Tallahassee, which is the capital city of Florida for about two years. And then I moved over to Jacksonville, which is again on the East coast, which is a bigger city and got to cover some pretty big sports there. So that was really my introduction into, I, I don't want to say big time, but I got to cover bigger sports than I've ever had, like professional football here, American football, uh, big time college sports. Um, they have NASCAR, PGA tour golf. Like it was, there was a lot. And then I worked there for about nine almost 10 years and then that's when um in 2008 is when the economy tanked and i had been at that station so long that i knew they didn't want to pay me what they were paying me so they didn't renew my contract and i ended up moving back to california i got into pr and marketing when sort of out of the business for a while then then crossfit came around and that's how i got back into it yeah ideal that that, that kind of time then like ready to ready to step into those shoes yeah the obviously when people pursue anything, whether it's competition, whether it's a career, whether it's a relationship, um, there's something that they find meaningful and something that they uniquely bring. What is it that you find meaningful about this aspect of your career? Wow. That's, no one's ever asked me that before. That's a good question. Um, I, I just love what I do. I it just, it doesn't feel like work to me. Um, I mean, there are times where, you know, there, my uh, friend of mine always said, yeah, there's a reason they call it work and not fun. There are times it does feel like a job, but I love being able to someone I heard, a, I heard a question on another podcast uh, that I listened to and a guy asked a play by play, a commentator, um, why do we need commentators? Why do we need play by play people? And I thought about that and I said, that's a really good question. Why do we need most people can just watch a sport and they know what's going on. And they're okay. And, and the thing that popped into my head is, well, why do we need soundtracks for movies? And they just enhance the experience. So I enjoy trying to enhance the experience for the viewer by educating and entertaining and maybe providing a little bit of insight uh, along with the person who's sitting next to me as the analyst to make them better fans. And it's, it's also cool to have, you know, I've been a fan all my life and to have the perspective I get by, you know, sitting in the booth and, and doing that it's uh it's that's a rewarding experience for me to have that perspective but i like just being part of the whole production of things i've loved team sports my whole life i've been part of team sports my whole life 
broadcasting is a, it's a huge team sport, especially when it comes to doing live events. You have so many people who have so many jobs they need to do it and they need to do well in order for you to have a good, a good broadcast that it, it's really rewarding to see those efforts come to fruition and to go back and, you know, watch a broadcast that you did and, and see all the stuff that you were able to accomplish. And, you know, we miss stuff and that's part of live TV, but, um, it's just a, it's fun to be part of that whole crew putting on that production. Yeah. I can imagine like it all comes forwards and or it all comes together and create something great in some of its parts. Right. The, like you talk in line with that idea about you providing unique insight and kind of adding to the, um, adding to the depth that someone can experience the event at. What is it that you find many people would miss without you? Like what's that kind of, uniqueness that you can provide i think uh again it's like a movie soundtrack there we try to give people audio cues of when hey this is really important or this is no more of a a subtle time in the event uh i think we can call out things and throw in uh pieces of information or, or experiences we've had with the athletes that give them more depth make them more relatable uh you know if you say something as simple as Hey, that person has adopted, you know, a couple of rescue dogs and, and their names are this people who might be dog owners say, Oh, that's really cool. I'm going to cheer for that person. It, it, we're able to, I think, just give depth to the broadcast and, and make it more than just about who's winning, but we can, we can uh, personalize the athletes in a way that even if someone doesn't even know the sport is tuning in, they might hear a tidbit about someone being an ex, you know, a former track athlete or so this person played, soccer or this person was a, you know, was a nurse who used to live around the world. And that, that kind of stuff people find interesting and, and, there, and there's hooks that they can get that they have in, in order to, uh, to pay more attention to the athletes and, and care about them. So I think for us, it's just about filling in details and, and, and making it more than just, okay, these are, there's 10 athletes on the floor and they're trying to get here first. It, it makes it, I think more of a complete story. Yeah, that's about to say the word story. Like it's, it's almost like you frame, you take it out from being one specific moment, one specific mm-hmm. event, and create a and provide the external narrative around it and surround it in kind of this flesh that people go, oh, okay, I can relate to the right. this as an endeavor as opposed to a kind of a unique experience. When you're thinking about commentating, when you're when you're thinking about your experience watching CrossFit, what events or what what stories particularly stand out? Oh man, there's so many. I think one of the first was, I think it was, was it 2013? I think it was 2013 at the Central East Regional. Uh, Lindy Barber, who went on to compete at CrossFit Mayhem, uh, she had had a back issue and back surgery and her doctors told her that she would never squat again. And she was on the verge of making it to the games and we had shots for family watching and we saw, you know, we, it, that was a cool moment to, to have. I mean, of course, there's the Rich Froning thing, him winning four straight. There's, you know, and then, you know, even everything he went through to get there, uh, there's the Matt Fraser story. There's, you know, there's athletes like, uh, you know, Samantha Briggs is, is so fun to, to cover. And you know, in 2013, when she won, that stands out I'm trying to think you just 2014, the regionals, the battle between Scott Panchik and, and Rich Froning, uh, was, was great to watch. Um, yeah, Tia Toomey in 2017 winning for the first time. That was a great moment. Mm. Those are, and just there's events too that that you just you look at you know from a visual standpoint and uh, the what happened on the floor, like uh, legless. I think about that was such a fun event in, in the tennis stadium. The way that yeah, why was that out. so fun for you? I think it was just the way it looked, the way it played out, and the atmosphere. There, there was the tennis stadium is hard to beat. I, I love the Alliant Energy Center and the energy that is in there, and the fan experience. But there was some, there's always just something special about being outside at night under the lights. And I, that event started, I remember they had the national anthem, they had a flyover, or no, they had the national anthem, they had fireworks, and it was three, two, one, go. And then they just started. And everyone was fired up. And the, and the way that it looked on the floor, too, that's something I think Dave does very well at that. He doesn't get enough credit for Dave Castro. When he programs event, he had, an event, he has a really good knack for making it look appealing to a viewer. And that that rig with all the ropes out there and the barbells. And that's the first time we'd ever seen legless rope climbs. Um, it was just, it had all the elements that you need to have to have a good event. And then it had the great race from the men at the end uh, where it was, I think it was 
was it Marcus Hendren dived across the finish line in order to beat, I think, Travis, uh, uh, Jordan Troyon and Rich Froning was right there as well. It just, it all came together perfectly from a competition to, uh, from a competition standpoint, from the way it looked and then the way it played out. So that, that was one that really sticks out. Then, you know, the Burden Run that same year was an event that's always been a favorite one of mine because they used all, the entire, uh, the entirety of the campus really there in, in Carson, California. But there are just, there's so many moments that stand out. And especially even it's just this last year, all the event, all the moments that we had with you know, Annie Thoris daughter and, uh, you know, Madero's winning and uh, Laura Horvath's comeback and Scott Panchik's final year. Like there was so many just great moments that we got to be part of and, and, uh, and share with the viewers that it was really a special experience. Yeah. Are there any comebacks that come to mind? Like if it was the one that kind of epitomizes what is a classic comeback? Um, I mean, there's a, there's one that stands out to me was, uh, Cole Sager in 2016 was dead last, I think after three events and wound up finishing, I want to say inside the top 10. And then there, there's Pat Vellner in, uh, 2018, every year, <laughs> every year, really, yeah. you know, like he's starting in a hole and comes back, you know, and did it again this past year. And then the biggest one though, I think is when he, you know, dove off the cargo net and had to go to the hospital to get checked and came back and, and had the had the finish that he had but why was that so like kind of why is that got that emotional response there i think because you watch that happen and you know he that was not a like a soft fall that he had and, and he was spitting up some blood afterwards and people love pat he's just a great guy he's very easy to get behind and to and to cheer for um and it looked at the time like he might be done especially when they had to send him to the hospital and he came back and uh, he's just one of those people that everyone wants to do well, but he always has that one thing that just puts him in the, you know, in the thirties to start off. Then he's got to charge his way up the leaderboard. Uh, but I think he's just a guy that, that resonates with fans. They just, they really like the way he handles himself. He's a class act. Uh, and when you see someone like that have to go through those, you know, those struggles, mm -hmm. um, it makes it, I think it makes it a lot more, um, a lot more impactful. Yeah, he's a humble guy and very kind of human yeah. as well. You see that yeah. kind of like yeah. imperfection and the slight, the slight vulnerability that comes along with that, and you like, go, oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> like I know those kind of imperfections. That's the, yeah. I'm full of them, and um, yeah, it's 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 good to see. What about a a classic kind of disappointment or failure? Um. Oh, uh, well, I think about you know, there's Matt Fraser at the soccer chip or the year I think it's 2015 when Ben Smith won. Mm. And to watch him struggle with the pig and on the rope climbs. And, and it's one of the very few times you're ever going to see you know, Matt Fraser struggle like that. It's, it's, it was, you could see that you know, the lead was slipping away and you could, he realized it, he knew it. And uh, there was nothing he can do about it. That was tough. I mean, there was rich Froning, and this is before I got involved, but of course in 2010, when he couldn't climb the rope, uh, that's a real famous one. And then, and what's cool about both of those moments is that what happened after that, you know, their, their careers afterwards were you know, dominant to say the least. Uh, I think about Tia Toomey, the two years that she finished so close to Katrin and wasn't able to win. And then the redemption story in 2017, where she comes back, comes back and wins by just two points. That was pretty incredible. Uh, but there, there are moments that are tough where you see an athlete and then, and you see it play out in a lot of events who, he gets stuck at a barbell and just has to sit there and stare at it. We saw it with Haley Adams in, uh, in 2021, this past, past game. But those are, the, those are the main ones that come to mind. And then Catherine Davis' daughter, again, this is another one. I think it was 2014 uh, when she couldn't climb the rope at regionals and then didn't make it to the games. And then the following year comes back and wins. Those are, those are the ones that stand out. And it's probably because of not just the disappointment, but again, what happened following that, that makes it so meaningful. Yeah. It's a nice framing of a story that you get that right. complete arc and you yes. come around. And, and that's something again, it. that you tell fans about and they, everyone loves a good comeback story. And yeah. when people don't, people learn that for the first time, it, it humanizes those athletes, makes them more relatable and they want to, and, and because everyone's had disappointments and it, it allows them to just relate to them more.
yeah it's like a great piece of music you kind of go away and you're like right. oh where's this going like this is yeah. and then like oh it comes back and the harmony's there and it's all those right. elements that come back it's like yeah that's that resolved it for me um what about like in the same line as well like what about experiences of just mental toughness and grit that you've seen um wow there's a lot there's i mean well, i shouldn't say a lot there's one yes, that yes, i would think about the trail run i think it was um Jen Smith on the trail run in 2016 had hurt herself and was just gutting through that, uh, but refused to quit. Um, there's, uh, I'm trying to think who else that was, that's the main one that, that stands out. Um, you know, Scott Panchik this past year, I think is a big one. He, you know, he knew that his knee was not hundred percent and he went out there and, and, uh, it, refused to quit He's, and we talked to him a couple of weeks ago and he was saying now oh, there was there was one a couple of moments where he thought he might have to withdraw and he didn't and he, he kept going um those are the the two ones that come to the top of my mind um yeah i'm trying to think about anybody else who may have gotten hurt and tried to, to gut through some things but you know all those athletes are doing it on a daily basis on a you know mm. at a competition they're they're all hurting they're all banged up um there was, I think it was Cassie Lance McWhorter a couple of years ago during a speed clean ladder. She, she was on the final barbell and she missed it. And the time, time was winding down and she was going to finish last in the heat anyway. It didn't matter. Her, her place was locked in. And the couple of five, there was like 10 or 15 seconds left. And she was going to, she just kind of waved to the crowd said, okay, I'm done. But then her fellow competitors got out there and said, no, 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 you need to do this again. I think it was 2018. You need to do this again. And the crowd got up, got behind her and everyone was cheering. And then she hit it. And it was a great moment. And it was one of those moments where it's like, you didn't have to do that, but because you are the competitor, you are, you went out there and, and you did it. There's uh, Cody Anderson, I think in 2014, one of the first clean ladders we ever did. This small little kid uh, goes out there and, and cleans, you know, 300 plus pounds in order to finish the ladder. Stuff like that is, is pretty incredible. And you talk to these athletes and, and you look, you view them a lot as sort of superhuman uh psycho assassin robots who have no emotion and then there's no fear. But when you talk to them all, they do have nerves and they do get nervous and they do doubt themselves at times. Um, and they figure, find out a way to, to get it done. And I'm sure Cody was feeling that I, I you know, Chris Spieler in 2011 on the dog sled, that is a, that's a famous uh, piece of video and imagery. If people haven't seen that, go look it up. It was at the games in 2011 where he had to push a dog sled and to do it, he you know basically put his head almost on the ground to move the thing. And, 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 what makes those moments so special is again, they're relatable. We have all been in the gym. We've all been like, I don't think I can do this. Or I, and then to watch someone who is one of the best in the world do that and then overcome it, it makes you realize it's like, Hey, it's okay that I struggle. It's okay. That's part of the deal. It's how I respond to it. And to watch uh, Spieler do that in 2011 is just, it's one of those iconic moments in his career. It was an incredible career. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like those are all moments that I can kind of, I replay them. I've got the visuals yeah. as you're talking through them and it's like, Oh yeah, that, that has that emotional kind of pull. And the thing that like, the thing that I keep on hearing through this podcast series is that it's very common to think that elite athletes don't have the struggles and they've learned to kind of banish them or kind mm -hmm. of like, or they don't have that chatter in the head. In fact, they've just got that kind of they've got the response to it there they have the ability to have a conversation and see that that is not them it's just a part of their personality it's not all of them um so it's really interesting to yeah. hear you say that and and point that out again because it's really useful to for people mm -hmm. to hear what do you see that that maybe other people would miss you've obviously got a unique perspective like you obviously see things and have a have a different viewpoint so yeah what do you see well, I think that's part of it, it, getting to talk to the athletes in a way that maybe, uh, you know, a lot of people don't have an opportunity to, to talk to them about. And we, had, like, again, we had just a great conversation with Scott Panchik a couple uh, weeks ago. And it's that, that viewpoint, that view that these athletes are so good and they're so confident and they have no doubt and they have no, uh, there's nothing in their head that tells them they can't do it. They, they know that they're one of the best. And Kristen Holta said this too. We talked to her uh, last week and she was saying how, you know, she, she doubted sometimes whether or not she could still do it. Now, this is a woman who has finished, I think, inside the top seven every time in the, the past like, five years at the games, gotten better. She's gotten older. Now, most people would look at that and be like, why are you thinking you can't do this when you are this good? And to hear the way that they, they experience that and then how they deal with it 
I think is pretty special because it, it, it was definitely an eye opener for me to, to hear that from Kristen Holter. Cause I have a view of her that she is like this stone cold, silent, just assassin out there. But to hear her say that, you know, she was mentally drained at the games and she had times where she doubted whether or not she was going to be able to do that is that's pretty incredible. And, and to, to, to realize that the, the, they're human, they're human, just like us. They're just really good at this, but they do have those, those uh, human foibles that we have, and they have the same doubts. It's just, they're on a bigger stage and people who go into a gym and you, know, you look at the workout of the day and you go, man, I don't know how, how I'm going to be able to get through this. They have the exact same thing. They just have a way of dealing with it. They just know that they have to put that aside and they have to go out there and they have to do their job. And I find it, I find it amazing that they're able to do that when they're in a setting where thousands of people are watching them. You know, I have enough time, a uh, hard enough time if I'm in the gym and a couple people are watching me and I can't do something. Like it's so frustrating and you feel so terrible, but to have that same experience in a setting where thousands of people are watching you and to be able to put that aside and continue and go do your job is just, it's, it's, it's always a surprise to me when I hear athletes talk about that, because I just, I have so much respect for them and everything that they do that, you know, it's, it's hard for me to realize that, wait a minute, they are human and they do experience things and, uh, and doubts and emotions just like we do. Is there anyone aside from Kristen who you've kind of, you've seen as this almost impervious being like something they can't. And then like, there was this kind of awareness that, oh, they're very kind of human, human beneath yeah. that surface. I think Tia comes to mind. And I, I remember, and I talked to her about this all the time. I, uh, the first time that we ever saw her was 2015. And at the time, what we would do with the athletes is from a media standpoint is that we would all, we would have them in uh, throughout the day. I think it was a, before they would start. So it was like a Tuesday, the week of the games. And we would bring them in and we would you know, get them in their uniforms and we would shoot different video with them. We would do ask them questions just in case during the, during the competition, you know, if someone was doing well and we needed to tell a deeper story about them, we would have that video that we could show to the, uh, to the audience. And Tia came in and I, this is the first time I've ever met her and I'm like, okay, Tia Toomey, no idea who this is. We'll just get through this because clearly she's not going to be, you know, someone who's totally wrong about that, obviously. Uh, and she was so nervous and she was, uh, and she jokes about it too. She goes, I remember those questions. And you asked me, what was my least favorite move? And I just couldn't think of anything. So I said, uh, thruster. And then you said, what's your favorite move? And you, and she goes, and I go cluster. She's like, where did that come from? Uh, and to see the journey that she's gone through from that sort of timid, unsure, uh, athlete to what she is now. And she'll still admit that, you know, she's still, I'm sure she still has some doubts and things like that, but she has just structured her life and her training to make sure that anytime those things come up, that she knows how to quash it immediately. But you know, she was, she is such a completely different athlete than she was when she, she first showed up on the scene in 2015. And it's almost laughable to, because I was like being in the room and talking to her then and just seeing this timid kid who clearly did not think that she belonged there to now seeing her knowing that she belongs there and you know, knowing that she is the best. It's, that, was a, that was a cool experience to witness firsthand. You must see so many of these individual journeys of people and like both those journeys that are kind of leading to this point, like with Tia and Matt, and then also these journeys that kind of stumble and then fade away. But have you seen a, can, an average shift? Like think about your time within CrossFit and especially when you're observing the higher levels, have you seen like a shift in professionalism and attitudes between then and now? From the athletes? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think when, when we first started, the first time I ever did the games was 2012. And, uh, the sport was still, I would say in its first infancy, I would say right now we are in our second infancy as we could, as we look to grow this back, but not very many of them were, were media savvy. Uh, social media was not what it is now. I mean, it was still something, but it, it, it clearly wasn't the, the presence that it is now. And they didn't have some of these athletes didn't, you know, a lot of them didn't have agents, coaches, anything like that. It was just sort of we're really good at this. We work out more than uh, just once a day and we're going to show up and we're going to be competitors. And now you have you know, athletes have, you know, they have people, they have teams, you know, Justin Medeiros rolls with, a, I don't know, like 12, 13 people. He has family. He has different coaches. He had, you know, they have nutritionists. They have uh, people who do body work. 
uh, and most of the top athletes have that. There's also, a, I think, a, an understanding of how to deal with media and how to put themselves out there and, and how to answer questions and, and how to be in front of the camera that maybe wasn't there uh, just nine, 10 years ago. Uh, there's also the them having people help them with you know, when they're available for certain things. There are a lot of times for, if we want to talk to an athlete, we have to go through a manager now. It's not as easy as just reaching out to them on Instagram. We can still do that, but there more and more it's happening where we have to f- talk to the agent, talk to the manager, talk to the coach. Uh, so that is, I think those are the ways it, it's definitely become you know, more professional, not only just from, a, from the way that they organize and they, and they run their lives, but from the way they conduct themselves uh, in front of people as well. Yeah, like, and have you seen a a change in their mentality around training at the same time? Yeah, I think, I think back to 2012, I'll never forget this. We were at the Central East Regional, and this was the first time we were, we were doing that broadcast um, as a warm up for the games. And Rich Froning at the time was destroying everybody in that competition. And I think the first day they did three events, which at the time seems like a lot, like that's a lot of work for 2012. And there was an interview with him and he was back in the athlete area and he was sitting in those lounge chairs, those Reebok lounge chairs that they would give him. And he made a, he made a remark about how, Oh yeah, it's not that big of a deal. It's just like a typical, typical training day for me. And that blew people's minds that blew their minds. Wait a minute. You're working out three times a day. No one does it. That's incredible. Uh, And so not only has the realization from the athletes uh, enhanced about how they need to approach their training as far as a volume standpoint, they're getting smarter about programming it. They're getting better about reaching out to coaches who can help them get better. You think about a guy like Chris Hinshaw, who got on the scene in 2013 after he helped Jason Kalipa, of all people, become a better runner. I mean, you can, if you can make Jason Kalipa be a better runner, you're good. Uh, he, he's a guy now that everyone looks to do it for endurance coaching. You have strength uh, coaches. You have you know, strongman coaches. You have uh, mobility coaches. They, they have really gotten good at surrounding themselves with people who know how to make them better. It's not just, this is the coach who does my programming and then we'll just figure it out from there. They, they, it's a team now of people behind these athletes. And that's really what you see, you know, in other sports that are, that are individual based, uh, whether it be tennis or, or golf, you know, they all have professional golfers have swing coaches and they have mental coaches and CrossFit athletes have mental coaches. Now they have, you know, fitness trainers, they have this whole team that makes them what they are. And now CrossFit athletes are, are on board with that as well. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting to hear about you saying just how many people are hitting three sessions a day now. Um, I think in a, a lot yeah. of people who are lower down the rungs of CrossFit, it's probably not quite necessary. But like you speak to someone like, I was speaking to Emily Rolf the other day, and mm-hmm. she's like full-time radiographer, full-time wife, obviously, invest in mental training and in the run-up to the games, hitting three sessions a day. And it's just, okay, so she was saying how she wakes up at, she does night shift, got to be in work at 4 p.m. And then she's, getting three sessions in that time and it's just the sincerity with which people take training now is phenomenal yeah if you want to be successful it's a full-time job like you i I don't know you're not going to be able to do well at the game i mean you can make it but you're not going to finish inside the top five if you have a full-time job and you're training you've got to make it your only pursuit now do you really think do you think there's no way to i don't know how given you know given where the standard is now with people like tia and um you know, and what Matt Fraser did, that was the focus of their lives. That's mm. all they did. They got up, they had everything taken care of. They have everything taken care of for them. They train, uh, and then everything is set up in their lives to make sure that they have no distractions. And that's all they got to focus on. You can do it. It is, it, it's, it's, it's just becoming a lot tougher to find athletes who have full-time jobs and who show up at the games and who, do really well. It can happen. There are some people who are that gifted and that, that talented, but if you, I really believe if you want to make it to the top, like that has got to be your single mindset and your single pursuit. That's all you have to focus on right now. Yeah. Yeah. And talking about like kind of getting to the games and blowing people away, Justin Deros, like how, like excluding the obvious answer of he's fitter. Yeah. (laughs) How has he got to where he is now? How, how do you win the game this year? I think Justin is one of those guys who was really smart to, first of all, find a good coach. And he found Adam Neifer, who is, has a ton of experience 
not only as a competitor, but a coach in this space. And Adam is smart enough to know what he doesn't know. And he was able to very quickly reach out to people who could help Justin fill holes in his game that maybe Adam knew that he wasn't going to help him fill himself. He found, uh, and you can see this in the, in the latest um, Miles to Madison episode that released, we're recording this on the 27th, released on August 26th. It's on YouTube, and they, they take a very good look at, at Justin, and they show him working out with a guy who was just trying to build his upper body strength. He's a strongman uh, coach. Trying to, and, and Adam said, let's go get that guy. And I think they were, they were very, very intelligent about how they went, went about this whole thing. And clearly, the kid is gifted. He's a great athlete. Uh, he, is, he has an athletic background that I think translates very well in a CrossFit with wrestling. Wrestlers always, for what, for what, because they're crazy, I think, make such good CrossFitters. Tough uh, as well. Oh, yeah. And, and I've, you know, I believe, too, that with wrestling, when, you, when you're doing it, you realize, like, if I take a second off, I lose. Mm. And that's the kind of mentality that if you go into CrossFit with that, you're going to do very well. Uh, but he, you know, and, and he, growing up, he played all kinds of different sports. He just had a very broad and general uh, base of fitness to build on when he got into CrossFit. But I think the key for him was finding the right people to help him get better as opposed to just relying on one coach. And it's hard, I think, sometimes for coaches to say, hey, I don't know how to do this, but there's someone who knows how to do it better. Let's go talk to him. That's tough for someone to say, I don't know how to do this. There's someone who's better. Uh, is not an easy thing, but I think when you're able to do that, uh, you definitely open up some doors that will make you better if you just kind of check your ego a little bit. And and Adam Neifer has certainly done that. He's it's just a perfect. They, the two of them are just a perfect match. You know, I don't know if that would have worked with anybody else, but something about the two of them just clicks. Yeah, it creates. It takes a lot of humility to say, actually, I don't know this. Sure. Um, but if your purpose is create the fittest person possible. Like mm -hmm. it, it makes sense. It completely makes yeah. sense. You obviously spent a lot of time speaking to like kind of wrapping yourself in this environment of elite performance. Have you seen any shifts in your own mentality and your own approach to training um, because of this? Um, training, I think I've gotten, I've just gotten smarter. I think the older I've gotten, the older I get, the, you know, the better I was and, and the smarter I need to be with my training. I think for me, uh, it's the understanding of, I think when, uh, let's see, probably about I don't know, eight or nine years ago, and this goes back to the whole rich running thing, like, oh, I train three times a day. People were like, oh, I just need to train a bunch of volume. I just need to just beat myself up on a daily basis. And that's, that's going to be the key to me getting good. And I think a lot of people fell into that trap, me included. I thought, oh, I'm just going to up my volume. I'm just going to do this. I'm going to do like three workouts of the day. And that's really going to, that's really going to help me. And then you understand that it's, that is part of it. That's, there's times for that, but it's also about just being smarter with your training. And I think as I have uh, talked to more people and seen what people are doing as they you know, advance past their athletic primes and into their 40s, then onto their 50s, how are they training and how are they being the most uh, efficient with their time inside the gym? And for me, that, that's, uh, that's part of it. I still love to challenge myself and I still want to make sure that I am the best version of myself that I can be. And whatever that is, that's fine. If that only means I can you know, I'm never going to crack four minutes on Fran or five minutes on Fran. So be it. But if that is my best, then great. Uh, but I've tried to become a lot smarter about things. And, and it's hard because I'm competitive. And I want to, I always want to do the, or the workout as prescribed. But I've gotten a lot better at looking at what is the intended purpose of this workout. If, I, if it's to finish inside five minutes and I'm going to do it RX and it's going to take me twice as long, I'm not getting the intended stimulus. I focus a lot more on what is the point of this. Is it to finish? If it's to finish inside 10 minutes, I need to pick a weight and a scale on this movement to make sure that I can hit it with the right intensity to do that. And I think ever since I've started doing that, I've been, I've been feeling a lot better, you know, because when you get older, stuff just doesn't heal as much. You know, I've got nicks and bumps and bruises and stuff that's, that's wrong with me that I need to kind of work around every now and then. But uh, that's, that's the, the knowledge that I've been able to gain from people like Pat Sherwood and Matt Chan, uh, and, you know, guys like that who are really good programmers, you know, Adrian Bosman and listening to them ha has really helped me dial in my own training. And I just do it for fun. I, mean, I just want to be fit for life. But again, I want to make sure that I'm doing it. That gives me, is that the best that I could do? Am I the, am I the best at where I am with that? Um, I don't know. And that's why I always like to keep, to continue to push myself. I, I just don't want to be, I don't want to settle, you know? Mm. Yeah. Again, it takes a huge humility check to, to do yeah, that. It's to tough, say, like, how's it supposed to feel? Right. And, and that's the thing. It's like, everyone wants to do like, if the, if the workout is supposed to be like a four minute sprint and you know, if I do this RX, it's going to take me seven. 
dial it back and do the workout the way it's supposed to get. Cause in the long run, you're going to get more out of that than you would struggling through. You, you totally tend to, you totally change the intended stimulus if you don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. A complete left turn here <laughs> and, and a complete change. And Annie Thor's daughter this year and the past, like her, her pregnancy and everything that's happened around there. What do you, like, how did you find that? Like, what, what are you thinking when you watch that unfold? I was, it was funny. We were talking about her uh, on our podcast and what we thought she would do going into the games. And the consensus that we came up with was that she had the biggest range of any athlete. It would not shock us if she finished inside the top five because that's who she is. Wouldn't shock us either if she finished, you know, 15th, 15th through 20th because she's coming off what was a very difficult pregnancy and, you know, raising a daughter, that is not easy. You know, uh, she had plenty of reason to not be, 100%. But as you watched her compete, it was like, man, she's back. Like, this is one of the best versions of Annie we have seen. And the one, the moment, it's very rare that you can put your finger on that moment where it's like, oh, yeah, that is right where it happened. Uh, the, the, the snatch that she hit it, I think 200 pounds it was. And the mm -hmm. look on her face, that was when she realized that she was back and she could actually compete. And I think that's when everyone else realized, okay, this is not a fluke. This is actually who Annie is. It was incredible to watch. And, and for it's, it really is just a, it's just a credit to the athletes. It's just how good they are for her to be able to overcome what she overcame to perform at that level that quickly is incredible. Mm. And it was it was such a great story. And, and that's why I, I, I really think that these, these past games were so memorable is because we had so many of those you know, great human moments. And to see Annie have that look on her face in that setting, we've all been there, whether it's like we hit our first muscle up and we're on top of those rings and we're super excited or we PR a snatch or, or whatever it is, we've all had that experience. And to see her have that and then that realization and that, that switch flipping in her head where it's, yeah, okay, I can do this. Uh, that was that was a moment that it's going to be remembered, I think, for a long time. That image of her is going to be one of those iconic shots that you that you see from the games. Yeah, the shock and the joy and yeah, surprise right. is, is so mm -hmm. good. And again, like like you said, like you can frame it in your own journey. You can see those moments, like you, mm -hmm. see, and just, especially from a coaching point, when you watch someone get their first like even like a push up or like a pull right. up or something, it's like there's that that moment of like, oh, I belong here. Like mm -hmm. I deserve to be here. I've worked hard enough and I'm good enough to be here. And that's just like such a good feeling for humans yeah. to get. And I suppose that's probably what CrossFit does so well for such a oh, wide I think, I think you're variety right, yeah. of human beings. It's like, oh, I like it's intimidating and it can be intimidating in some scenarios, but like, you know what? I do belong here. And it's like through good coaching and everything that goes along with that. It's like, yeah, good community. I, I do belong in this. So a few questions kind of like that I like to finish, finish up with what was the greatest athletic performance of your life? Wow. Greatest athletic performance of my life. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's slim pickings. Um, <laughs> let's see. <sighs> Trying to think. Um, I don't know if one really stands out. I've, it's been so long since I've been in any sort of organized sports. Uh, I had a couple pretty good, had a pretty couple pretty good ice hockey games as a kid. Um, I think there was a, oh, I know it. I got it. Okay. Um, there was a, there was a, a high school football, American football game that I played in. It was my senior year of high school. So I was in grade 12 and we were playing the, uh, one of the best teams in the area. They, they had a, they were always really good. And we did not, uh, we didn't win the game, but I remember it was probably my best game. And, and I, uh, this, at the time, this, this team was so big, the school they were, their Nevada union was their name. And they're up in um, kind of on the border of California and Nevada. They had their, their, their program was so popular. They had their own radio broadcast. Now that was unheard of when I was a kid, like that, no one did that with high school sports back in the nineties. And I remember, uh, my brother was listening to their broadcast. He's like, man, they kept mentioning your name. And I was like, really? He goes, yeah. And so I, we tried to, I ended up getting the broadcast and they were, it was really cool to hear them be very complimentary of me. And I, it was one of my best games that I ever had. So that was, I'd probably say that would, I'd put that one up there because it was just not that you need validation from other people, but it was cool to hear it from people who knew nothing about me, it's noticed nice me on the field. So, yeah. And there's um, been a couple of just like hockey games here and there, but I, that's, I think that's the one that probably stands out. I know it's difficult to think back across 
decades of how you, how you <laughs> felt at the time but how do you remember your mental state at the time do you remember like what that like people would call it a flow state do you remember what that felt yeah. for you I think it was, it was one of those things where it's where preparation, you know, you knew, I knew I'd prepared enough. Like I, I knew what this team did. Um, but yeah, it just seemed that like everything was going right. Like I, I was, I was reading the plays correctly. I was getting there on time. I just felt like, and, and it's, uh, it's almost, it's, it's acting without thinking. And when you can, when you can eliminate that, in, in a team sport, that's when you're dangerous. You can play with speed and not, and you don't have to think about it and you just go. Uh, and I think that's where I was. And, and we had played this team uh, a year prior and they hadn't changed. They were still doing the same things. Um, so I had that experience under my belt a little bit. And again, they beat us, but I had a pretty good, I thought I had, you know, I had a great game, but yeah, there is that flow state of, you, you know, you've put in the preparation, you know, you know what you're doing and then you, you do one thing right. And then that builds confidence. And then you get another thing right. And then that builds confidence. And then just sort of that, that momentum builds. And I think that's probably the, the way that it was for me. Yeah. So when you're commentating as well, like what are the commonalities between that state then? And when you feel like you're on the top of your game? I think it's a good question. Cause I think it's uh, they're so different as far as what is required. You know, one is athletic performance. The other is more, more mental. And it took me a while and I'm still always evolving with it, but it took me a while to get my preparation and uh, my sort of pregame routine down to where I knew that when I showed up, I would be prepared. Now, a lot of it for me, excuse me, is having the right tools as well available for uh, a broadcast. We have, especially at the games, we have a lot of bells and whistles that are available to us, a lot of technology that is available that helps us do our jobs. But the knowing that I put in the preparation on the athletes that I have all my notes organized to where I can access them easily. And then just, you get, you do, you get into this flow state where you're not really thinking about what you're saying, you, you're just, it's just coming out. It's sounding good. Uh, and then having a good partner helps with that. You know, I was very lucky to work with Chase Ingram this past year at the games and he is fantastic at what he does. And when you have that next to you, you know, that if I fumble here, he's going to be able to pick it up and vice versa. If he has a, a time where he's not really ready to say anything, I can continue. And to have that faith in your teammates that builds confidence. Uh, but for me, it was really about I dialing in my preparation, knowing how to organize my information so that I'm not like flipping through pages and pages of stuff in order to find things. And I think when people first start uh, in the broadcasting world, they over prepare and it's it's uh, almost paralysis by analysis. You have so much information and you're not going to get to maybe a tenth of it. But it's it's understanding now for me, you know, what I need, how I need to organize it and how I can quickly access it so that. Uh, when we're in the when we're in the broadcast and I see an athlete, I know I have a little nugget on that athlete. I can look it up really quickly and I can I can spit it out. So uh, a lot of it just comes in the preparation. You know, I, I take a lot of time beforehand um, so that when we're in the thick of it, I don't have to. You know, it's just automatic. I can just pull pull stuff. So that state, like, there's a few things that kind of characterize it. I think is, but I want to get your opinion just to just to hear about that. Do you reckon it's forced or unforced? The, the, that state of mind. That's, yeah. Um, I think it's forced in that you have to prepare for it. I think, you know, you just can't show up and all of a sudden it's like the, you know, it's like you're a, a Jedi and the force just, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you have to prepare, you have to, uh, you have to know, um, you know what, what's going to happen. You have to understand like what the expectations are. You have to have a good knowledge of everything that's going on. You have to be organized. And if you have that base, that's when you can hit that state, I think. But if you show up unprepared and you don't know what's going on, and believe me, I have been there in, in, a, in when we've gotten in a rush where I didn't quite know what this event was. You know, I didn't have this detail down. Anything like that hinders you from getting to that state. But when you know what the event is, when you know who the athletes are, when you know, you know all the small details, when you know how it's going to play out, when you know you have the tools at your, at your disposal, I, I think you're, yeah. you're much more likely to get into that sort of quote unquote yeah. flow state or in the groove or whatever you want to call it. But you have to earn that. Yeah. You have to earn that with preparation. Yeah. So when you're actually in it, it feels kind of like flow, right? It feels unforced, yes. but like you kind of construct the parameters to, to kind of, to enable you to be in there without right. worrying about other stuff. Like yeah. And a lot of that too is based on the prep, the, the, the preparation and the performance of other people. And that's why I go back to when I said, you know, broadcasting is a team sport. You know, if, if the director and the producer don't know what they're doing, 
it doesn't matter how well prepared I am because they're not showing the right pictures or they're not telling the right story. Or if uh, the camera people aren't getting the right shots, all that needs to come together. And when it does, and then that's where I, where I'm really lucky is that f- for the most part, I work with the same group of people and I have so much confidence in them because I think they're the best in the world at what they do, that it makes my job so much easier. And I can just focus on me where things tend to break down in team competition, regardless of what it is, is when other people trying to do other people's jobs and you're not staying in your lane. And when everyone stays in their lanes and they, they do it well, uh, things go, things tend to, to work out just fine. Yeah. Nice. Is there anything else aside from preparation that you're doing to put yourself in the best, like, actually, let me phrase, phrase that. Is there anything you're doing aside from preparation to aid your mental health on a daily basis that makes you feel good that makes you kind of like okay this is puts me in a good place yeah that's that's something i think i definitely need to work on i have i'm not very good at unplugging and uh and just letting things sit i'm always especially leading up to like uh, a big event like the games i'm always i always feel like i have to be looking at something i have to look this up i have to look over my notes again i have to well, did I miss this? Maybe I need, let me look this up again and make sure that's right. And there, I think that that's good to a point because it means that you're very focused on details and you want things to be good, but it is that paralysis by analysis. I, I need to do better. And I think I've gotten better at this still, still needs to do some work of unplugging, walking away, doing something else and having confidence in my preparation and knowing that I've done all I can up to this point. Uh, the, you know, the, the haze in the barn, you know, the work's done. Now it's just time to perform. And, and I think that uh, having more confidence in that for me is, um, is something I need to work on so that I can unplug, that I can rest up. And so that when I get to Madison or you know, wherever we're going to do an event, when it is time to go, I'm, I'm starting with a full tank. It's not that I've been, you know, I've, I've been constantly just noodling this stuff over. And I, I've had to a couple of times really stop and be like, just turn the computer off, go sit down for a second, go enjoy your family and unplug. And I'm not the best at that, but I, it's a constant struggle and I'm trying to get better at it. Yeah, it is a constant battle to like care for yourself, to look after yourself and to prioritize your own mental health. It's, it's a tough one, but it's, uh, yeah. it's something that, yeah, it pays, it pays a lot back to you. A nice... Yeah. A nice simple one to to finish up. Um, what event has uh, caused the biggest shift in the way you live your life? What event? Yeah, has caused you know, the biggest shift in general, just the crossword wise, or in the like it maybe it caused a big shift in the way you kind of you saw the world and act in the world. Is there anything around that? Well, I think right now it's what we're going through with the pandemic. Mm. Um, you know, there's been some there's been some good things that have come of it for me. Uh, being more appreciative of the people around me, more appreciative of opportunities to you know, get out and actually be around people. Uh, I think that's what made the game so special this year is that it was pretty much back to normal. You know, um, there were, there were, it was great to be amongst the fans. Uh, it was, it, I really in, tried to enjoy just walking around the Alliant Energy Center and being just, hey, we're here. This is really cool. Whereas in the past, maybe I didn't take that as, as seriously. So there's, there've been some good things uh, f- that have come from this. It's an awful time. It's a terrible time. It's made me a lot more appreciative of the people around me. Uh, I think it has made me realize again that, you know, I saw a great quote the other day. It's like, it's not, that we're not all on the same boat. We're all weathering the same storm. And some of us are in yachts and some of us are in rowboats and some of us are, you know, just wearing life jackets. And it's important to be, to be kind to people and to be empathetic to people so that we can all get through this together. Um, and that's something I try, I fa- believe me, I fail at that. I try to live my life like that, but I fail. I do. Um, but it's then from the, from the bad standpoint, it's been, it's been disheartening that not, not everybody's thinking that, and that there is, there are people out there who don't get the, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're all kind of weathering the same storm and we need to help each other out. And there seems to be, it seems like we've lost that a little bit, but it's definitely this, this whole, this past year and a half, and then being a dad too, like the, I, my son was born right before this all happened. That has definitely changed my perspective on things. And that has made me you know, a lot more aware of how I'm behaving and that, you know, he's watching, my son's watching. How, how do I want him to, even though he's super young, he's only 18 months old, he's watching. 
And it's made me much more aware of my own behavior. You know, how am I acting right now? How am I reacting to things? Uh, because, you know, I look back on my childhood and I realized that there were things that I picked up on that I wasn't aware I was picking up on. And that got put into big time perspective when I became a dad. I understood that, oh, you know, my behavior and the way that I do things really does matter. And it's about, you know, I really want to set a good example for him. Uh, you know, there are times when like, if I feel like losing my temper, like I don't, I, I try not, you know, I got to be good at not doing that because I don't want him to see that and think that that is the right way to react to situations. But being a dad and then everything that's been going on with the pandemic has really you know, changed a lot for me and some of it good and, and some of it, uh, I don't want to say bad, but some of it has, has been disappointing, but it, it's stuff like that. Just, it puts things in perspective. And you know, you, I, uh, it's funny cause like five years ago, I'm, I was not the person and I do not, I didn't have the perspective that I have now. And I think that's one thing people need to understand is like, you're always changing. Like you are never who you're always going to be. It's always changing. You know, five years from now, I'll probably be someone different too. Um, but I think the, the pandemic and being a kid has definitely, definitely accelerated that process. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine that, uh, like, I, yeah, the, the pandemic for me has shifted everything and shifted yeah, priorities a huge a amount. And I can't imagine the combination of having a child in, in within that time period as well. Like, it must be, yeah. yeah, crazy to be more aware of the impression you're giving off and the fact that someone's learning from you. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm competitive. I'm passionate about stuff. I, you know, and as as a sports fan, I'm a fan of things and. Uh, being a you know fan is short for fanatic and you do, you know, I'll react to just dumb stuff that I don't have control over, you know, and I need to like, when he's there, I've, I've got to dial that in. Like I can't show him that. And it's, it's tough. It's a challenge, but you, you realize it's just how important it is. And uh, to your point of just uh, the pandemic, it's the, I appreciate so much more now the opportunity just to talk to people and to be with people. Um, and, you know, we're, we're lucky where I am because it's not as bad as where it is in other places, but it's just like, I'm just so, I just, I'm itching to get back to normal. You know, I yeah. just want to get, get this thing behind us. Yeah. It's difficult to appreciate what you have until it's taken away from Right. You. Just and minor stuff. things. Yeah. Like I never thought I'd appreciate just going to a concert as much as I do now. I haven't been to a concert in forever. I would just love to do that. Mm. Um, you know, those little things, they really matter. You don't, you don't realize, like you said, how, how much that matters until someone takes it. Just the ability to just sit down and have lunch with a friend. Yeah. The challenge for everyone is going to be keeping this gratitude. It's going to be like, okay, uh, yeah, I, like right. three years from now, like, okay, do I remember what it was like to not have access to these right. kind of events? Like, do I remember what it was like? And like, kind of, okay, yeah, this, this is a great moment being able to go out for lunch with my friend or grab a beer right. with my friend or whatever it is. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. I think it's just like, we'll be more, I'm with you. I hope that we are more present in those moments and yeah. put our phones down and enjoy each other. And that's another thing. I like guess it's, it's so easy to get addicted to, to technology and sit there and stare at your phone, like put the thing down, like, like experience, experience things a little bit more, appreciate being together with people. And I, when I see people that are all together in a group and all, you know, like five of them, they're lucky to be together and they're all staring at their phones. And I just want to grab them. Like you are wasting this opportunity. You know, you don't, this is not something that we get to do just whenever we want to anymore, you know, take advantage of that. Be present. Yeah. So I, it's this an aside story. I went, um, I went out clubbing for the first night in a decade, maybe. I wasn't even, I didn't even enjoy it a decade ago. <laughs> and then I went out clubbing <laughs> with a friend up in Sheffield, which is like a university yeah. town. And mm -hmm. I walked in and it was kind of like mid pandemic as well. So it was kind of weird, but I just saw like this group of like six girls around the table and they all had drinks and they're all looking at their phones and then they'll occasionally sit up and like take a selfie yeah, and then what? go back to their phones. It's just like, you're out with each other. Like, I know that. it's, it's weird. And, and we've all done it. I've been there. Yeah. Like we've all done it. And I was just like, I, that's another thing I got to get better at. Like put, yeah. just put the damn thing down and enjoy the experience, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think that was the moment I realized that I was at least a decade old and everyone in there. I was like, yeah, <laughs> this isn't for me. Yeah. There are those moments where you go, Ooh, I don't, I don't belong here anymore. <laughs> I'm not as young as I thought I was yeah, anymore. Exactly. And <laughs> um, Sean, thank you so much for this. Where can people find out about the podcast, uh, find out a bit more about you, follow you on Instagram, that kind of thing. I'm on Instagram. My, my handle is S Woodland five, three. So you can find me there. Our podcast is talking elite fitness. We have an Instagram account for that as well. It's at talking elite fitness. Our podcast is on um, Apple podcasts, Google play, Spotify. We're available there. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel. I don't, we don't do as much on that, but we do some things. We're trying to get that bigger, but yeah, that's where, that's where they can find them on Facebook and Twitter as well. So yeah. everywhere yeah. covering on the basis. All right. Exactly. Thank you so much again. Thank you, man. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me.